Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. I do a lot of talking about liberty and about libertarianism and capitalism. And today we're going to talk about the history of the libertarian movement. And here to help us do that is somebody well-equipped. He's the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. He's also the author of many books, including Liberty or Lockdown, and has written thousands of articles. Jeffrey Tucker, welcome to the program. That's good to be here. I think my camera is going to be following me around in some weird way. Let me see if I can shut that off. No, that's it. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. So I guess a good place to start is I think of, or I guess to start would be, what is a good definition of libertarianism or what used to be just liberalism? Well, what you just said is correct. Um, and hardly anybody understands that. But after the Second World War, a lot of the people who opposed uh, the New Deal and were concerned about the nationalization of the economy during World War II were trying to figure out how to find their get their bearings in the new ideological environment which was a strange place um uh concerns over human liberty weren't even a, a thing really everybody seemed to agree that central planning was a good thing but um they didn't like the term conservative which had been promoted by uh, russell kirk in 1954 in his book called the conservative mind and i agree with that i mean it's a weird book um i mean it's an interesting book but it didn't really seem to have much of an intellectual, uh, it didn't have an apparatus that would have allowed any kind of serious resistance to the encroachment of the state. Um, and then, of course, the word liberal itself seemed to be gone, uh, that it was taken by the New Dealers and before that the progressives. So, uh, so they were looking for a new term. And the term libertarian had a little bit of a presence uh, at the turn of the century, but not much of one, but it really meant just sort of favoring freedom more than anything else. And so they said, well, why don't we just, since nobody's using that word, why don't we just use that term? And that became the the new uh, moniker for, for what used to be uh, called liberalism, liberalismus. Um, and every language had a term called liberal, and it meant a free economy, a free people, free speech, free movement, and uh, free minds, and all that kind of stuff. So, so libertarianism is not a new ideology. It traces back. Um, it's it's an orientation, a, a concern that says basically the purpose of politics is to promote and defend human liberty first uh, above all else, and that everything else flows from that. That's that's the idea. Of libertarianism of course it it came to be a little more codified than that over the decades with the work of um, murray rothbard and that sort of thing um and robert nuzik and many other thinkers <laughs> but basically it was a is the new term for for liberalism is what libertarianism is you said it has a long history in, in my view i think that the first person to put forth sort of a systematic defense of what would come to be called libertarianism i i would say it would be john locke in his two treatises on government yeah yeah do yeah. you think that's accurate well those are the those that the second treatise on government is the was the basis of the declaration of independence so um yeah that was pretty darn early and his main starting point was defending religious liberty um for for everyone, excluding Catholics, by the way, <laughs> but beyond that, uh, it's for everybody. And and yeah, I I I don't think that's entirely inaccurate. I think that's pretty. I mean, John Locke had a major um, impact on on the world through the writings of Thomas Jefferson, for sure. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's not. I mean, there were people who wrote about liberty uh, long before, all the way back to, back to the ancient world. But in modern times, like yeah, John Locke is as good a choice as any. I agree with that. So he said that the essence or, or the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property, mm -hmm. and that's the basic sort of libertarian credo for you know a broad swath of people that identify as libertarians. Yeah, and like you said, he influenced the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, which of the founders would you say were, I, w I don't want to call them libertarians because they would have had an abundance of contradictions within their thinking, sure. but 
which ones were the precursors of what we consider to be modern? Uh, certainly Thomas Paine, um, especially in his early writings, was really, really great. But then Thomas Jefferson, too, more so than any of the other framers. Uh, well, he wasn't even involved in the framing of the Constitution. He was the major influence behind the Declaration of Independence, which is still a, just a wonderful document. Um, he changed life, liberty, and property to life, liberty, and pursuit of the happiness because, in part, uh, the term property in those days meant, of course, uh, slave property. And he was really a, 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 a strong opponent of slavery. And he was suspected by many people as being an abolitionist, and I think probably rightly so. So they were very suspicious of him. That's why they didn't want him to be the second president. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the second president? Yeah. So in um, 1800, he won that election because they suspected he was an abolitionist. I think rightly so. I mean, you know, we're we're talking right now on a day in which the New York City government is removing statues of Thomas Jefferson from the city hall and other places around town. Really? Um, yeah, it's really just tremendously tragic. And Monticello itself, his old home, has been taken over by woke ideologues who just do nothing but trash Thomas Jefferson as a as a slaveholder and all this kind of this stuff. It's just really quite wow. quite wicked what's happened. <laughs> That's a subject for a whole a whole other podcast. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's awful. Yeah, it's really Jeez. grim. Yeah, and you know, and I think one of the reasons the statues are coming down is not because he held slaves, but because he favored human liberty. And now, the left is just completely against human liberty, and the right has its own problems too. Yeah. Sometimes the right wing seems good as compared with the left, but you know, there's a lot of problems there also. I wrote a whole book about that. What role? Like Locke presented what was basically a moral argument that th th this is the proper role for the state. But free market economics has also played a, a, a large role in advancing liberty. How mm -hmm. big of a role is, is it and how, how important is an understanding of free market capitalism in, in advocating human liberty? Well, you know, as uh, the work of, of Adam Smith on, on, on economics, especially the wealth of nations, it's just a mighty treatise in defense of the division of labor and trade as an institution. It's it's a great book. And uh, but but then about fifty years later, there's this guy named Benjamin Constant, who's a, a great French thinker, came out with a a really powerful essay called "The Difference Between the Liberty of the Ancients and the Moderns." And what he says in that essay is in the ancient world, to be a free person, to be freeborn, meant to be part of the aristocracy, and that meant, in turn, having some influence over the shape of public life. Uh, some say in the, what the kind of the law, the way the laws worked, but that but uh, that was an aristocratic sort of status. It didn't belong to the merchants, certainly not to the slaves or to the commoners. Um, Benjamin Constant observed that the, defi the definition of freedom dramatically changed starting in uh, uh, in the late 16th century, the mid, mid to late 16th century, once we really did move very far away from feudalism and people started owning money, and it was their commercial rights, the commercial marketplace that really defined the essence of what it meant to, to make freedom operational. To, to make freedom meaningful in your life was bound up with the commercial marketplace. And that's what he said freedom really is. Um, and that's the modern understanding of freedom is that it belongs to everybody and that we exercise those rights primarily through our economic decision-making, our right to start businesses, the right to spend money how we want, to keep what we make, these kinds of things were hugely important. So a central pillar of, of freedom itself and you'll notice one of the things about modern liberalism, or by I say modern, I mean uh, starting, you know, the turn of the uh, 19th century to the 20th century, is that the liberals were were putting a high premium on freedom of speech and um, those kind of concerns, freedom of religion, that sort of thing. But they never had much of a great appreciation for free enterprise and the free commercial sector. And that's turned out to be true now. I mean, Brownstone Institute has a ton of writers who consider themselves as coming from the left. And so I'm very good friends with all these people. So, you know, we're always debating um, issues together. And you can always tell uh, that the left has a little bit of a blind spot, always has, about economics. That's why they were tempted by the idea of socialism. 
they thought socialism would somehow emancipate people from from the tyranny of big capital. Well, that didn't really happen. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, it didn't really happen. So um, even even now, a hundred years later, uh, the the left has yet to really come to terms. I mean, they may reject socialism in the sort of Stalinist way or the Mao Zedong way or whatever, or even in the um, Swedish way, but. Uh, but they're they're not really very friendly with the free enterprise. They can't really come to terms with it. Uh, they 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 tend to think free enterprise is corrupting the transactional economy, uh, commodifies human beings in a way that's not that's not good. That uh, leads to inequalities of wealth, which they can't stand, and so on, and so on. So it's 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 frustrating actually. So uh, the modern libertarians should occupy an unusual position in the ideological uh, orientation. It's neither left nor right. Uh, has a great and uh, profound appreciation for the commercial marketplace, but also steadfastly defends all the values that the left used to support, like freedom of speech and and freedom of religion, that sort of thing, and against all kinds of you know overbearing institutions. Uh, uh, to telling people what they can and cannot do. And it, it's friendly to, to certain values of the right, uh, love of community, um, tradition insofar as it's organic uh, to human life, uh, very tolerant towards religion, the family, and that sort of thing, but rejects you know, the right wing's love of uh, executive power and war and that sort of thing. So it really is a, a third thing. And unfortunately, these days, I mean, impossibly. It just doesn't have much of a, uh, a, a, a big space in the public mind. It, it should, but it doesn't. You mentioned two things in there that caught my attention. You mentioned socialism, and then you mentioned 100 years ago. The reason it caught my attention is because 101 years ago, a book was written that, in my view, should have put the nail in the coffin of socialism. Mm-hmm. The name of the book was Socialism, and it was yeah. by the great Ludwig von Mises. Yeah. In my view, von Mises is the greatest economist who ever lived. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to know, what, as an economist yourself, who do you think the greatest economist was? So I agree with what you just said. That's not to say you didn't have limitations, but uh, but overall, uh, Mises is my go-to on everything. That book you mentioned, Socialism 1922, is a masterpiece. Absolutely. And it's not just the chapter proving that socialism can't work. It's the attack on Christian socialism. It's the attack on uh, all sorts of things. Um, it's it's the, the the ending section on destructionism um, as as the end point of, of ideologies that are inconsistent with the structure of the society and, and the nature of man, that sort of thing. Um, it's just a, a a brilliant work. I mean, I like the book Socialism. I also like his 1927 book called Liberalism. I think those are two really great books. So, of course, human action is wonderful, and so is theory and history. And you could go through the whole list. It's hard to identify one, but but I agree with you. Socialism is is a masterpiece. What was I going to ask you next? I forgot. It slipped my mind. Okay, well, 1943. 1943, three books came out by three women. They were oh. I, Ayn Rand, Isabel Patterson, yeah. and uh, what was her, what was the other one's name? Rose Wilder Lane. Yeah, Discovery of Freedom. Yeah. What was the impact on on the liberty movement and on society? In general? Just to be clear, uh, the Rand book would have been Fountainhead, right? It was the yes, the Fountainhead, yeah. the God of the Machine, and Discovery of Freedom. Yeah. Uh... So of the three books, I mean, Fountain, Fountain has a wonderful book. It's it's a wonder, it's just a wonderful book, and it's and it's a celebration of man's creativity, you know, and the achievement of, in making beautiful new things, and a, a great tribute to the ability of 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 the human human beings to overcome all kinds of barriers in the way. So it's a typical Ayn Rand uh, uh, piece. I, I, I like Atlas, I think, I guess, a little bit better um, and her other works, but still it's a, it's a very important work. And it also put her on the map and made her a bestseller. Um, Isabel Patterson is a very interesting thinker and writer. She was a hugely prominent person in, in New York literary circles. And her book, God of the Machine, is a weird book, except for the one chapter called uh, humanitarian with a guillotine, which is my favorite. Yeah, which is a chapter. It's about how 
when they when they come for you, they're always going to tell you they're doing you good, right? And and that humanitarianism can be you know a, a deadly dangerous. And so it's a it's a really a brilliant book, and it applies to all sorts of things, you know, from woke ideology to welfare states to to war, and it's, it's just great. And Ayn Rand learned a lot from Isabel Patterson, a ton. And she didn't often credit her with that. In fact, they got into a huge argument uh, over the intellectual property of, of their ideas. And Ayn Rand's a big you know, champion of intellectual property. And she thought that, that Isabel was stealing from her and Isabel thought Rand was stealing from her, which is all very sad. I mean, if you're getting together with friends, you're talking about ideas, you know, the idea is to, is to share with each other, you know, and to learn from each other. That's good. Yeah. What's wrong with that? That's fine. You don't have to figure out which idea belongs to whom. And actually, ideally, you combine your ideas to come up with something completely new. I mean, that's the whole point of conversation, one would think. But boy, did they come after each other. They were uh, they were funny, a funny bunch. And so that began a kind of a long uh, problem in the post-war uh, libertarian world of people failing to credit others for each other's ideas. And so so later, you know, many, many people learned a ton from Rand and didn't credit her, uh, partially because, um, well, I mean, because she was always arguing with everybody. And so, you know, so like my my uh, my own teacher, Murray Rothbard, uh, was, you know, two thirds of his brain, if not more, maybe four fifths of his brain was was uh, taught by Rand on a whole series of areas, but he stopped even citing her, really, because because he was this so This is against. breaking news. I yeah. mean, it's not breaking news that that's the case, but yeah. the fact that I've got Jeffrey Tucker on my podcast and just said that, that is huge. Well, but it's just true. It's I mean, the truth. Yeah, I, he couldn't I, bring himself to... It's a psychological thing. I'm just like, if, you know, um, if you just... If if you're part of a group and that's hugely influential over you, and then they kick you out, you know, because you deviated on one particular point, you're gonna feel a sense of bitterness. And and every time you come it comes down to an opportunity to cite, you know, the 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 the, the rabbi is in the shoal, um, you're going to be very reluctant to do it just because you can't you can't it's it's like it's, it's there's a frog stuck in your throat, you know, and that's why Murray always treated Rand, um, which is kind of tragic. Um, uh, and I, but you know, whatever. M Murray learned a ton from Rand. There's no question about it. I mean, all the all the basics he learned from her. Yeah. And uh, he wrote her a letter and said he had never heard of it's implausibly. He'd never heard of the idea of natural law before Rand started talking yeah. about it and natural rights. So, you know, there's that. And uh, he learned a lot from her spirit, you know, and and her indefatigable ways. And yeah, he was he was a, he was a big. I would say he was a, like a break off of the Rand group. There were many break offs of the Rand group. Of course, yeah. Murray went on to do great things himself. But you know, we all we all build on somebody else. I mean, so much of my own thinking has been so heavily informed by by Mises and by by murray murray's murray's spirit of life was just beautiful and i i learned a lot from it um and mises inspires me all the time so you know we and hayek you know does too so you know we all learn from other people there's nothing wrong with with citing them or crediting them I, I, i'd like to get to the point where we can be a little more generous and and kind towards each other and admit who our influences are <laughs> that would be great i i, I myself i overwhelmingly influenced by Rand and probably uh -huh. can tell by the title of the show, the rational yeah. Egoist. but economics is Mises all the way down. Um, mm -hmm. Well, but Rand things. said the same thing. I mean, she always deferred to, to Mises on, on yeah. economics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, but, and I think I, I disagree with my disagreements with Rothbard are almost all political stuff with his, mm -hmm. as an economist, mm -hmm. man, economy and state next to human action is probably in my view the best economics book i've ever read mm -hmm. I, I i found rothbard to be absolute wizard when, when it came to explaining yeah. economic concepts now all these thinkers you know they're coming together in the you know 40s 50s 60s and there was also an organization i don't know the exact year it was started the foundation for economic education yeah. leonard leonard reed's baby what yeah. role or, or how influential was that? That's the first libertarian think tank, right? Am I wrong about that? Was there one that preceded it? 
Well, um, there is the American Institute for Economic Research was founded in 1933, but not so much as a think tank, but more of as an investment advisory. So, but FEE was set up to be a think tank. It, it isn't anymore, but it was. And um, that was 1946. So that was uh, three years after Roosevelt Lane, which we didn't mention anything about Roosevelt Lane. No, no, we didn't. Yeah, <laughs> but just to back up slightly, the Discovery of Freedom yeah. is a great book. I mean, of the three books, that's the one that's most overtly libertarian. Yeah, it's just a, a wonderful book, Discovery of Freedom. I love that book. When I first read it, I thought it was a little bit childish, and then years later, I reread it. I thought, no, this is a serious, this is a serious masterwork. She was the daughter of, of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, and a very important person in New York literary circles herself. She was very close to Garrett Garrett, who was a novelist of the 1920s, and rumor is that they they were lovers, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but uh, yeah, she's she's a really a profound thinker and a, and a great writer in her in her own way. It's too bad she's kind of been forgotten. But in 1944, there were two, three really important books that came out. Uh, one was Mises's Omnipotent Government. The other was John T. Flynn's As We Go Marching. Great attack on the uh, New Deal and the warfare state, which is fantastic. And then uh, Hayek's own book called Road to Serfdom. Those oh, all three came out. What a great book, yeah. Yeah, the, all three came out in 1944. Uh, of the three, I don't know, they're all three masterworks, really. But Fee was started two years later, uh, in part to be a home for these for these ideas. So you look at Rand, Lane, uh, Patterson, uh, Mises, Flynn, and Hayek, you know, you can see the growth of something big and something important. I mean, Hayek's book was a bestseller. Um, Mises' book was not, but John T. Flynn was a really important figure in intellectual life. Rand's book was a bestseller. So there seemed to be something gathering. And so Leonard Reed started the Foundation for Economic Education, and, and it was a serious place. And uh, one of his first actions was to, um, three years later, he bought up the first print run of Mises' book, Human Action, which was translated out of the German, which had been published in 1940, which he had been writing since 1934. And uh, Fee, Foundation for Economic Education, bought up the first print run and distributed it them th themselves. In fact, that's the only reason the book was published, was because of Fee. So they had a really huge impact. And then it was um, it was one of their early monographs against price controls that Murray read, Murray Rothbard read when he was in graduate school, and it got him into <laughs> free market economics. And... Um, and that led him to Rand and so on. So exciting times between 1943 and 1954. Is that when Atlas Shrugged came out? Yeah. Atlas came out in 57. 57, okay. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Garrett Garrett because I actually had a, got into quite a debate not too long ago. Somebody mm. claimed that Atlas Shrugged was plagiarized. Oh, it's just, Garrett. listen, yeah, people need to shut up about this yeah. stuff. Um, it was, I, but so I went and bought the book, The Driver, yeah, and it was good. so different. I mean, it was a good yeah. book, but yeah. it, it, it it had nothing to do with Atlas Shrug. Right. So, look, um, it's very likely true that Rand read it when she was in uh, in Hollywood script writing, because he was a very popular novelist in the yeah. early 1920s. He wrote about five novels, Cinder Buggy, uh, Satan's Bushel. Uh, the driver, se several others, really. One, I love all of Garrett's books, and she probably read them because he was a hugely popular. I mean, nobody remembers this, but he was uh, a real master of. And his his claim to fame was that he celebrated the the beauty and glory of Wall Street and capitalism, right? So I I think it's very likely that Rand read him. I I don't see how she could have avoided it. Now, if you know, thirty years later. Some themes were echoing in her head from that book. And then she, you know, out of which she produced Atlas, you know, but let's see, are we still alive? Yeah. yeah. Um, that would not be unusual. And and a lot of times we're influenced by things we don't even know for sure that we are, you know, like I I write every day and you know, I extract information from wherever I can find it. <laughs> you know, I don't always credit it. I mean, it's like we're shaped by something. Yeah. So uh, to call it plagiarism, though, as Justin Armando did, as the guy who, who claimed this, he was always hysterical. He was always making wild claims that without any ability to think through them very clearly.
you know but that was yeah. his whole life you know he was he was mr hyperbole yeah. oh ran plagiarized get no she didn't she has a masterpiece atlas shrug is a wonderful work it wasn't sui generis it didn't come out of nowhere it was possible she was influenced by certain themes in the driver and many other things and there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. To call her a plagiarist is is really outrageous. It, it, it is. The uh, the Foundation for Economic Education has a real special place uh, to me because I read two books uh, at the same time. Well, I was incarcerated and I read Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. Uh -huh. And that sparked my love for economics that I've had yeah. ever since. And I also read a book, uh, Frederick Bastiat's The Law. Yep. And I found his logic just in incredible. But on the back of the book was an address for this place I'd never heard of called the Foundation for Economic Education. Yeah. So I wrote to them and I said, listen, I'm incarcerated. I like to read. Can you send me any materials that you have or information about your organization? And they sent me a one year free subscription to their magazine, uh, Ideas nice. on Liberty. Yeah. And I just devoured it. I loved it. But in there... There was a, a, a address for laissez faire books. Yeah. So I wrote to them and I got their catalog and they had a package. It was called the All Liberty Package or something. And it had human action, Atlas Shrugged, economics in one lesson, I think discovery of freedom and some maybe something else. And I and I ordered it and just completely revolutionized my thinking on, That's on the cool. subject. So Fee has a, a great place That's for me. Cool. That's and, good. you know, after that, after you know, I started to call myself a libertarian, which I continued to do up until maybe three weeks ago. I, I've stopped that because not because my ideas have changed or my views have changed, yeah. but there's just too wide of a net for me now Yeah, that the word libertarian, uh, you know, captures that there's just too many views that I, I can't or too many people rather that call themselves. Well, we use words because they clarify, not confuse. Yes. And that's uh, what I find and, is happening and, now. And yeah, now it's just nothing but a confusion. So yeah. I understand, I understand what you're saying. You know, I, 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 I agree. I don't, I don't use the term myself, um, not because it doesn't pertain, but because it's just, it don't, makes everybody crazy. Like, wait, <laughs> what about, you know? Yeah. So. so speaking of the word libertarian the libertarian party what what they ran their first president uh, candidate in what 72 yeah hospice 72 I, on whole has the libertarian party been a plus or, or a negative or neutral in, in your mind in advancing the great classical liberal ideas well the libertarian party probably has done some good over the years but uh it's never met up to its potential partially that is because uh, we live in a uh, in a, 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 in, a, a in a in a system where the government consists of uh, whoever wins the election wins the election. It's it's a first past the post, winner take all system, and Dervinger's law of politics says that that will always default back to uh, to to two parties, which which is to say the people vote strategically when they go to the election when they go to vote. They vote against the person that they hate the most and for the person they think most likely to beat the person they hate the most. That's how people vote. Right. And that always ends up being basically two parties. So we have two chambers. We have a Republican entrance. We have a Democratic entrance. We've never had uh, a prominent uh, third party uh, in, this, in this country. We had Ross Perot. We had the Bull Moose Party a century ago, but they were just flashes in the pans. So this is a, the problem that libertarians have always faced. So th that's a, a problem of, of game theory, of election theory, and they're never going to be able to overcome that. And once I realized that, I realized, oh, the libertarians are going to be basically an educational organization. So this is the problem that's always affected the libertarian party. They don't know whether they're trying to win elections or if they're trying to influence uh, public life. And they still can't figure this out. And since I've been watching the party, it's it's it always goes back and forth between two types, the ideologues and the managers. And it's the same thing all the time. The managers take over and run you know tip top, you know uh, they raise a lot of money, they get on all the ballots, they run a really clean organization, and they become really professionalized and very impressive. And then the ideologues get upset because they come to notice that libertarians are selling out. They're not taking hardcore positions on this thing or that thing because 
you know, part of winning a, a successful election marketplace is to curb some of the radicalism, right? So the, so the managers eventually go too far in downplaying libertarian ideology. And then the ideologues come in and say, oh, you guys are a bunch of sellouts, you're a bunch of wimps, we're going to take over. But the new managers don't, the new people that have taken over have no experience in getting on the ballot and raising money and actually managing an organization. So they bankrupt the place. They're saying all the right things, but uh, they don't have anything to show for it because the money's gone and the votes are gone and the ballots are gone, the membership's gone. Then the managers gradually creep back in and the cycle repeats <laughs> itself again and again. And this has happened, I think, in my in my adult consciousness, I think this has happened three times, uh, three separate times uh, where the ideologues come in and uh, clean up the place and say all the, the great true things, but then all the money goes away and the votes go away and everything falls apart. And then the managers take over and then gradually compromise the ideology, but get more votes. But what is, what's the votes worth if you're not saying good things? Yeah if you're not living up to the principles. So they get kicked out by the new ideologues. And this has just gone on again and again. And it's, it's, that's essentially what we saw in the most recent cycle. We had, uh, um, you know, during 2020, the, the managers had taken firm control of the party and they completely said nothing at all about, about lockdowns and, and, and censorship and the vaccine mandates and everything that was happening. It was the, the, the most atrocious time for human liberty in our lifetimes. The Libertarian Party couldn't talk about anything other than getting troops out of Japan or whatever. I mean, it was so ridiculous. So, of course, that made it ripe for a takeover by the, the, the uh, what, some, some, some um, really naive and novice-oriented uh, people that called themselves the Mises Caucus. And they were rabble rousing and, you know, right. So and really leaned in and focused and they ended up kicking out all the existing people. But now, of course, with the Mises caucus in control, the Mises caucus itself has fallen apart and the money's gone and they can't get on the ballot. And the whole place is in sort of in a managerial shambles. But this is just typical. It just ha keeps happening like this. And now the managers, after the next election cycle, where they um, get 1% of the vote or less, uh, and the money's all gone, and most of the Mises Caucus guys have already lost interest. They've sort of moved on with their lives, um, leaving the place a shell of its former self. And so the managers will gradually creep back in. You know, the Nick Sarwarks will be the new new uh, big, big shots around the Libertarian Party, and they're going to raise all the money and get all the get the party on the ballot and then the next war or the next lockdowns will come. They won't say anything about it because they don't want to disrupt their great management strategy, of course. And that's going to make another round of people very angry and they're going to take it. It's, 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 it's going to be nonstop like this. It just never stops. I've uh, been criticizing the Mises caucus lately myself and the, the, the a few reasons. One is they take the name Mises for their caucus, mm -hmm. when in reality, mm -hmm. they're the Rothbard caucus. They're far more influenced by Rothbard than they ever are by Mises. Well, I would say even Hoppe. More and than Hoppe, that. yeah. Ho yeah. Rothbard and Hoppe, yeah. yeah. The other day, I got into it with some guys because I posted a quote from Mises where he said, he criticized the anarchism. He, mm -hmm. he said that the classical liberal is not an anarchist. I didn't, but my point wasn't, I'm not an anarchist, but my point wasn't Mises was right in his statement. My right. point was Mises was not an anarchist. Right. And I got pushed back, but he was close to an anarchist. But, you, you know, you're guilty of presentism because when Mises wrote that, there wasn't yet anarcho-capitalism. And I looked, I didn't have it with me at the time. It was at my old house, but I went and got it. In 1922 in socialism, Mises writes, anarchists are neither socialists nor liberals. Because the claim that I was getting from the, the Mises caucus people is that when Mises was criticizing anarchism, it was only socialist anarchism. But I found the quote that said that clearly wasn't the case. So I find them to be dishonest with that claim. Then there's this that I find that this there's two things that pushed me over the edge with them. One was the Alabama Mises caucus 
posted a photograph. Do you remember when the Unabomber was wanted and they didn't know who he was yet and they would put up the picture of the guy with the sunglasses in the hood? The, the, the Alabama Mises Caucus puts that on Facebook with a quote from Ted Kaczynski. And then it says, R.I.P. Uncle Ted. And I just thought that was so reprehensible. This is a mass murderer we're talking about. So at the time, I was the spokesperson for the Libertarian Party of Connecticut. Mm. So I contacted leadership and I said, we've got to get out and, and, and uh, separate ourselves from that. We've got to say that this in no way represents us because we're a Libertarian Party. They're a Libertarian Party. And I couldn't get the leadership to go along with that. They wouldn't criticize that. And I'm... So I, that from there, I stepped away from the party. And the next thing was the anti-Israel. I don't, I don't like calling it anti-Semitic, but it was just a lot of hostility toward Israel and what seemed to me making of a moral equivalence between Israel and Hamas. And I went on to the Twitter page of the Mises Caucus, and it's dominated not by quotes from von Mises, not with arguments for Austrian economics, not with arguments for individual rights, but with stuff about how horrible Israel is. Mm. And I'm just, and so I just said, I'm done. I, I'm not calling myself a libertarian anymore. I don't want to be associated with that. Mm. But I have a question for you because you're here. So somebody from the Mises Caucus said to me, what is it that you disagree position wise with the Mises Caucus? And I said, anarchism. That's the first thing. Second thing is secession. I said their stance on immigration, which they're they're following Hoppe. From what I could tell, they're anti-immigration, and the Israel stuff. And the guy said I was totally misrepresenting them in paleo libertarianism. And the guy said I was completely misrepresenting their views. And I showed him well in their platform, the Mises Caucus says they're for secession down to the individual. They say that national security apparatus should be privatized as much as possible. And then they say, and just because something's not in here doesn't mean that, that we don't stand for it. So am I m misrepresenting them? Am I misunderstanding something? Well, I don't know, you know, because there's a, uh, there's a huge, there's huge diversity of views probably within the Mises caucus itself. Some, some good guys and some, some less, less educated people. Um, and so it's hard to say. I mean, I, the very founding of that thing, I was sent the uh, the founding document. It was just filled with gibberish, you know, like, um, we, you know, we believe in the, the praxeology is the foundation of natural rights and so this kind of stuff. And it's, it's like, you don't even know what these words mean. You're, Obviously not. You're, you're <laughs> if that, if that's around, what you're saying. It's throwing around a bunch of random, you know, uh, terms. It's like pseudo intellectualism, you know, so, and, yes. and so I kind of jumped on it and just like, Maybe just call yourself something else, like the uh, the shit poster meme <laughs> caucus, you know, <laughs> shit poster meme caucus. That would have been a good one. The the edge lord, yeah. <laughs> the edge lord caucus. You know, you come up with something else. You know, with the the edge lords, because you know the whole these guys were all their their whole ideological orientation came out of the 2015-2016 meme wars. Uh, that was that's what that's what shaped them you know and that was you know with pepe the frog and you know the helicopters and you know the whole bit and it was fun it was fun but it's childish it's just silly uh a childish at best a fascist at worst um yeah so... the, the guy that they've endorsed um is a guy named mike rechtenwald michael rechtenwald uh -huh. this guy uh he was a marxist until 2016 oh and okay. he stopped being a marxist not because he found out that the labor theory of value was garbage or that wage slavery was an inaccurate description or because he suddenly came to disagree with Marx about profit or, 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 or you know, the uh, proletarian or the, the <laughs> history, the dialectical materialism. It was because his fellow Marxists turned on him over issues to do with social justice, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, wokeism and that sort of thing. Subsequently, he claims to have read Mises um, in a debate that I had with him. He was on my podcast. He actually said that um, the Austrians are all deductive, 
they, they're they're not based on empiricism. And I said, well, that's flat wrong when it comes to Rothbard. Rothbard, I can show you the quote where he said the action axiom is grounded squarely in empirical reality. Because mm. Rothbard, of course, was an Aristotelian. And he says, this guy who's telling me he's a Rothbardian said, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, well, you know, it's, so. it's just, it's just you know, uh, in general, I think it's just a general point that people need to read more and pronounce less, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and the idea, I mean, so long as you brought this up, let's just be clear on what we mean when we say deductive versus empirical. Sure. The 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 point of of deduction as a as a methodological orientation in economics is to say that things like fundamental postulates like the law of diminishing marginal utility, uh, the law of supply and demand, um, basic understanding of monetary economics, these kinds of things, uh, just a handful of claims can be proven deductively and they cannot be disproven empirically that that's that's what the the uh the point is it doesn't mean that you can deduce everything in the world like you cannot come up with an ought out of out of an is i mean you can't uh, the whole you can't deduce history you know you can't d deduce political philosophy you can't deduce moral philosophy and ethics. I mean, it's, it's, it goes too far, you know? So deductions is, is an important thing and it's not particularly radical. I mean, um, uh, Ricardo believed this, Bastiat believed this, uh, all the old economists in the 19th century believed that all the essential laws of economics were a product of, but, of deduction from, from axioms. But, but let me ask mean, you something. The whole Jeffrey, world though. can be deduced because you're sitting in an armchair and whatever happened to you think you happen to think is true. That's not what praxeology is. But Mises, I'm, well, I'm sure Rothbard wrote this and it's my interpretation of Mises is that Mises when he talks about, I'm going far in the in the weeds. I hope the audience can stay with me here. Yeah, but when, me, when Mises talks about the, the a priori category of action, yeah. he's essentially writing as a Kantian. When he says mm -hmm. that this, this axiom exists a priori, he's saying that it's a fundamental category of the human mind sure. following Kant. Whereas yeah. Rothbard argues, no, we learn this from reality. That's from, right. Uh, th so it, it's not deduction. That's true. Rothbard doesn't use it in the same sense as Mises. Well, that's 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 an interesting point. I mean, uh, Mises was definitely influenced by Kant and his his use of those methodological categories and and axioms. No question about it. And Rothbard had a different foundation, which you can know immediately. I mean, it's interesting because Rothbard didn't actually write about this much. I mean, like if you look at Man, Economy, State, he spends you know, no more than 20 pages on the whole of the methodological foundations of economics, whereas Mises wrote about it for about 250 pages. So wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, and several big books on it. So it's it's a little, they have a, definitely a different orientation. Which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's that's great. Mises was his own thing. You know, he was a special guy and you can learn from it. Um, you don't have, to, don't have to accept everything he said, uh, and whether you have to accept anything that Murray said or or Rand said, you know. I mean, we we learn where we we learn, but let's at least describe it accurately, you know. You yeah. know, I I worry sometimes about the invocation of the term Mises because you know there was a time when he wasn't well known. Certainly before the found of founding of the Mises Institute, he was not very well known. Um, but the problem is that not everything that goes under the name Mises really authentically represents Mises' views. And I'm, you know, and it may not be possible to to represent Mises perfectly, you know. Um, this is why I'm I'm a little against taking historical figures like Mises and turning them into instantiated things like caucuses and institutes yes. and all these things. You know, when I, that's why when I founded Brownstone Institute, I really thought about this a long time. And I decided I didn't want to be held to the idea that I'm, you know, perfectly representing the views of, of Locke and Montesquieu or Paine or, or you know, whomever you want to name, uh, John Stuart Mill or whatever. Uh, so I, I chose a rock, you know, just a stone, because I didn't want to be restricted by the idea that I'm, I'm the great interpreter of, uh, of all things, uh, associated with one guy, you know. 
So, so that's why I did that. And so I worry about this. I mean, me, so the only thing I would say is whether it's the caucus or the Institute or this Mises thing or that Mises thing, that what, what people need to do is read Mises. Like what Mises yes. believed is, is, is in the works of Mises. You can hold an account either direction. You can say, well, I agree or I disagree, but at least, you know, don't don't trust some you know twenty two year old uh, shitlord uh, <laughs> to perfectly render the idea of Mises. You know, <laughs> come on. I, I agree. You know, that's part of the reason that I um, I'm very adamant about the arguments that I've basically started with, with the Mises Caucus people. This is, you know, the liberty movement and, and arguing for liberty, even when I was in prison, it's something I've studying and advocating has been what I've done basically my entire adult life. And I just find that the, the Mises Caucus is so outside the bounds of what Mises would have supported or, or what I would support or, or what I would think is proper for a, a liberty based argument and it's not you know that they differ with me on this or that or we argue over intellectual property it's a it's a lot to do with the the, the you the appropriation of mises's name and then the vitriol toward israel and just the whole demeanor and in, in the, the manner with which they they argue but i i want to ask you before i let you go what is the state in your view of the liberty movement today I mean, oh, I think it, it's I think it's I think it's catastrophically bad. Uh, it's never been worse. <laughs> it's never been worse since World War II. Um, it's just a, a disaster in every way. In every way you can conceive of it, it was taken over by oligarchs, uh, big, big money oligarchs, and racketeers running you know fancy conferences, but not actually doing anything. Tricking old men into giving them money for pretending to promote liberty, but actually selling out when it really matters. I mean, they said nothing about lockdowns, nothing about vaccine mandates. But all the major the major liberty libertarian intellectuals uh, uh, completely went silent for three years during the biggest crisis of statism in our lives. Um, and then otherwise uh, taken over by, you know, shit lords who, you know, think that liberty means posting, you know, memes of you know, memes of, of, of green frogs. And so, no, it's 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 and and racketeering uh, think tanks and and uh, cowardly academics. Um, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. Um, it's it's despicable, actually. Well, so, sucks. yeah. So I think it's I think it's in terrible shape. And I don't entirely know what to do about it, but um, it's what happens when when something becomes a grift rather than an authentic uh, movement from the heart. Um, I go to Porkfest every year, and I really like those people um, because they they all have r real lives and real jobs, and they're really sincere and and uh, they're wonderful people and doing great work for human liberty. I'd like I like the New Hampshire crowd a lot, but the academics, the think tanks, not so much. Uh, I think it's essentially a disaster. And I, I don't know when it's going to recover. Um, it's, it really has been taken over. I, in fact, I'm almost certain there's a CIA desk called Libertarianism, which with two or three employees that do nothing but subvert these organizations and, and get them to say inane things, you know. And, and it's easy to do, right? I mean, Libertarians are cheap, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I mean that that show on H on HBO called The Anarchist or whatever. There's no question that was just a deep state a deep state film. <laughs> no question about it, in my mind. And I, I think everybody knows this. You know, like even the the people who made it, you know, sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They got a big contract for it. So where'd that money come from? And how did it end up on HBO? I mean, so give me a break. Um, so it's not it's not authentic. Um, but anyway, you know, Mises said in his 1927 book called Liberalism, right at the very end, it's something that's haunted me ever since I read it. He said, um, you'll always recognize true liber liberalism, by which he meant libertarianism or liberty in general. Um, not because they have uh, music and uniforms and flags and marches and rallies and have big slogans and bumper stickers and memes. He doesn't say memes, but you know what I mean said none of that is liberalism. Liberalism is not a cult. It's not a religion. It's not a mass movement of uh, people fired up in some to rally behind some politician. Liberalism is good ideas. It's rational ideas. We have to have the good arguments. We can state them plainly and calmly. So when you find that movement, that is genuine liberalism. 
So I've always thought about this. This was 1927. This is even before the Nazis, right? Um, but he knew what was what. And uh, we've got a lot of a lot of fake forms of libertarianism out there today. And um, I don't think there's any future for these people. In fact, their fundraising is drying up because everybody knows they're lying. They're not really for liberty. They're for something else. <laughs> and and so their fundraising is drying up. So I'm ex expecting we're going to go through a, like a 10-year recession. But here's the thing for your listeners and for you and for me. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is what we put in our head and the ideas we hold in our heart. That's that's what matters. If it does good for you, then that's good enough. So that's that's, that's where we are as a movement. That's and, awesome. Yeah. All right. You mentioned the Brownstone Institute, Jeffrey. Where yeah. else can people find you? Uh, well, I write every day for Epoch Times, actually. And they run me and they, they have a physical newspaper, the fourth largest in the world. Um, and they run me almost every week. So oh, okay. I'm very happy about that. And I write for Brown, Brownstone. I think I have an article coming out, maybe now, maybe tomorrow morning. Uh, I've written some 300 articles for Brownstone, but it, it's become a real institution, a real refuge for people. We give away a lot of fellowships to scientists and others who have been canceled by the dominant culture. And so I, I feel like I feel like it's it's going very, very well. I'm I'm actually, despite what I said, I'm actually optimistic about the future of human liberty itself, not just not the movement aspects of things. That's that's what troubles me. Awesome. Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking your time to, to be here with us. I well, really you took really your time it. and I appreciate it so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All and the best. Now this is the Rational Legalist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.